it's a great pleasure for me to do this. As Louise mentioned, I've been doing, uh, uh, following in essentially a family tradition, which is uh, uh, doing a sculpture demonstration while I speak, uh, which stems back to my grandfather, who often, uh, who often did this. And uh, uh, I never grow tired of it. This is something that I absolutely enjoy uh, doing. So thank you all for coming this morning and for, uh, to, for joining me in this. Uh, this morning, what I'd like to talk about is autism. And as I think Louise mentioned, I have a son who is severely autistic. And that, of course, is uh, for those who have family members with autism or who have experienced it. In fact, autism is so frequent now that nearly everyone is, in one way or another, uh, touched, by, uh, touched by the effects of autism. Well, we, of course, with a son with autism, have been uh, affected by it very dramatically. And uh, as a consequence, it's an area that I have uh, I've put a lot of study into, particularly into the genetics of autism, uh, being a geneticist. But also, as I do this, uh, typically when, um, when I do these sorts of, uh, of sculpture lectures, the subject is someone who is, is quite famous. For instance, uh, President Holland, the president of our university, is a Lincoln scholar. And so he and I have been uh, going out and giving what we affectionately call the Matt and Dan show, which is uh, where he speaks while I do a, a statue of Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, and on a number of other occasions, uh, not long ago, we had in, in 2009 the 200th uh, birthdays of both Abraham Lincoln and uh, Charles Darwin, who happened to be born on the same day in uh, 1809. And so uh, I had a number of, of chances to do, uh, do statues of them. However, for those who have disabilities, other than a few who are quite famous, usually, uh, usually and I think un, uh, sadly, uh, many of them sit in the background unrecognized. And so what I'd like to do today is focus on, on people with autism. And the subject of my sculpture today is going to be my son Michael, who uh, uh, is, is now 18 years old. He will be turning 19 uh, this coming June. And uh, thus we've had, uh, uh, when he was born almost uh, uh, 19 years ago, it dramatically changed our lives in ways that we could not possibly have imagined. Now, uh, one of the issues with autism is actually defining it. The, uh, the name itself was... Uh, was coined some, um, oh, some 40 or 50 years ago. And in fact, the first person ever diagnosed with autism is, uh, is still alive, lives in, uh, uh, lives in the southern United States, and I believe is now in his 60s. And there was a recent article on him in the Atlantic magazine in a book that will be coming out uh, uh, soon about that. But before the, before the designation of autism, uh, Various, uh, various uh, names were given to it. And the, uh, some of them that, uh, that many of us grew up with, such as mental retardation was often uh, the term used. The uh, uh, pervasive developmental delay is one that still uh, comes around. And one of the issues now is defining exactly what it is because there are so many symptoms associated with it that it's clear it is not a single disorder, but rather something that we just sort of lump all in together as one, as one designation. And in fact, what we often see now is the designation autism spectrum disorder, implying that there are a wide range of symptoms uh, going all the way from those who have mild impairment and uh, uh, or what we would call high functioning to those who are very severe. And in fact, it's clear now that maybe even spectrum is not really the, a right, the right term to use, but perhaps array would be a better term because uh, of the combination of, of symptoms that may be associated, uh, associated with it. And as I'm going to talk about a little later uh, today, it's, it, there is good now biological evidence to indicate that, that this is not just a single uh, 
uh, a single disorder. The, uh, and what that raises then is one of the, one of the major concerns is, is autism increasing? which is a, a, an important question. When my son was first diagnosed, the, the thought was at the time that autism affected about one in 1,500 individuals. And then that dropped to about one in 800, then down to about one in 500. Not long ago, it was listed, what, one in 110, and some of the most recent data show one in 87. So in other words, uh, uh, by classifying autism, we now have it at a, a rate that's higher than 1%. In other words, uh, 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 more, than, uh, or more than one out of every 100 individuals who are born. And, uh, but again, part of the problem is defining it. Part of that increase in the frequency of autism is certainly due to just uh, redefining the, the disorder itself and also uh, the fact that it is now more widely publicized and we have better diagnosis of it that people who might have been diagnosed with some other uh, uh, given some other designation with their diagnosis are now being diagnosed with autism or with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, a number of researchers have concluded that there, in all likelihood, is a, uh, uh, an actual increase in the, in the frequency of autism compared to what it was before. And the evidence for that comes from the fact that when we look at adults with autism, autism, by the way, is a lifelong disorder. It doesn't go away. Uh, and there is no treatment that will cure it or, or treat it in such a way that it, that, it will, that it will go away. It is a lifelong disorder that persists from the time uh, uh, the, the child is first diagnosed with it and, until that individual dies. And there is also, uh, uh, in most cases, no, uh, uh, not a marked decrease in life expectancy so that most people with autism will live, uh, live a lifetime in, in terms of lifespan that we would consider to be a normal, uh, a normal lifespan. And as we look at adults with autism, uh, the frequency is certainly much lower than, it, than we see now of uh, children with autism, which indicates that there is probably indeed a biological increase in the frequency of autism, not just a better, not just better diagnosis or, uh, or better publicity about it, although those two also uh, certainly come into play when we look at the, uh, at the frequency of autism. So in other words, it is a, it is a disorder that now uh, is very clearly affecting a large number of people and, and therefore has become important for us in society. Now there are a number of uh, myths associated with autism that, that good science has managed to, uh, uh, at least for scientists, has managed to dispel, but certainly not, not in the general public. For uh, example, one of the myths I mentioned just a moment ago, and that is that autism is, is treatable and curable. Uh, there certainly are treatments for it. The best ones, the ones that seem to work the best, are educational. And uh, as a parent of an autistic child, uh, I can't praise enough the, uh, the teachers and the caregivers who, who, work in the, uh, who work in the public schools and through uh, uh, through various systems to assist families of those who have autistic children. Uh, the, the benefits that we have reaped from, uh, from very dedicated teachers who have worked tirelessly with my son, uh, we have just personally seen the effect that education has. And there's also good scientific evidence that education can make a difference, that many people who have, uh, who are on the autism spectrum uh, can lead productive lives and can, uh, and can make valuable contributions to society through intensive education. Moreover, many of the behaviors that, that, can, be, uh, uh, that can be problematic also uh, can be addressed through education. 
and many children can, uh, can learn appropriate behavior and begin to, uh, 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 to not cause some of the problems that they may have, have uh, caused had they not received the educational treatment. So education clearly is, uh, uh, is an important key to, to treating autism and will continue to, uh, to be so. Uh, some people have wondered, is, uh, what about medications? Are there medications that can be effective with autism? And uh, the, uh, as I was doing the research for this, interestingly, I came across an article that mirrored the, uh, the experience that we have had as a family. And that is, uh, as my son began, uh, we, of, of course, parents of autistic children search for any possible treatment or cure that will, make a, that will make a difference, going all the way from those that are prescribed by physicians and, uh, and carefully regulated to, uh, uh, to faddish sorts of things and even some treatments that, uh, that can be dangerous uh, to, to one's health, uh, all in an effort to do anything that's possible to try to, uh, to help their child. And unfortunately, uh, given the state of, uh, of medical research on autism, most of these treatments are just hit and miss. We don't know what treatments are, are most effective. And, and that goes even to the, uh, to the treatments that are, that, are offered by, uh, uh, that are offered by physicians. There is, uh, most studies are based on not on so much the biological effect, but rather looking at the behavioral effect of children once they are, are, are given medications. And most recent review articles suggest that there is very little evidence to suggest that, uh, that uh, uh, psychotropic drugs or, or drugs that are designed to modify neural or brain behavior have any beneficial effect. There are a couple that that can help with certain behavioral characteristics, but oftentimes the side effects associated with those are, are so severe that uh, they outweigh the small benefits that the, that the medications may, be, may provide, which uh, mirrors our own experience. As we worked with my son, we tried a number of medications and uh, either they had no effect or the side effects were so severe that we had to, uh, to discontinue them, and that that anecdotal personal experience that we have had has been now uh, verified through, uh, uh, through medical research. And that leads to the, um, the question, well, what is the cause of autism? Do we, do we know what, what brings it about? And uh, one of the, uh, probably one of the most prevalent ideas of what causes autism comes from the fact that many parents of uh, autistic children notice that the symptoms seem to first appear after the child receives uh, regular, the, the regular schedule of vaccinations. And so vaccinations for years now have been implicated as a possible trigger for, uh, for autism. And uh, many of you may be familiar with the popularization of this. Uh, Jenny McCarthy, for instance, has become the uh, the probably the most widespread spokesperson for uh, for vaccines being the cause of autism and recommending uh, treatments that unfortunately turn out to be uh, dangerous. For instance, uh, there is uh, con there was concern that certain heavy metals in in vaccines, particularly the uh, 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 mercury-based preservative thimerosal was the, the trigger for autism, which was included in, in vaccines. It was a, a preservative that allowed, uh, allowed the vials of vaccine to be used in multiple doses. That is, the physicians could, could draw out some of the vaccine, give it to a child, use the same vial, draw it out again because of the preservative that was in there, which prevented it from uh, becoming contaminated with bacteria. And uh, there's a small amount of mercury in that preservative, and so many people thought that thimerosal was the cause. Uh, just as a, uh, as a personal note on that, uh, I was, from my own experience, convinced that this, that thimerosal was the culprit. The reason being that uh, many people had, uh, it seemed that the